Well, I promised a number of you that uh, I would take a few minutes to talk about the context of tonight's debate and the circumstances leading up to it. Uh, Callista and I spent the last week in Rome, and I think that probably affects my approach a little bit. Uh, Rome is a 2,800-year-old city, currently has a mayor, a woman, the first woman mayor in the history of Rome, and she was elected by the fifth star movement, or the five star movement rather, which is an anti-corruption movement founded by a comedian. Uh, and uh, is now the second most popular party in terms of votes in Italy, uh, anti-corruption being a big theme in many parts of the world now. So I was sitting there in Rome because the uh, choir of the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception uh, was in Rome. They did uh, five masses and three concerts. And uh, I'm allowed to come along as Callista's husband. This is her 21st year in this extraordinary choir. And it gave me time to sort of get out of American politics and think about Roman history going back to the founding of Rome, the rise of the Republic, uh, the long period of Roman self-government, the collapse of the Republic into corruption and violence, the imposition of dictatorship, uh, the rise of the Caesars, and ultimately uh, the emergence of Christianity. Uh, and then that's only ancient Rome. Then you get to the Middle Ages with the, the de' Medici's and the um, Borgias, uh, with Michelangelo, with the Sistine Chapel, with the Renaissance, uh, and then you get up into the modern period. So it was, it was a pretty remarkable week. And it was in that context that I was suddenly startled by a number of my friends in the news media who began emailing me and saying, what do you think of this tape? Uh, what about this extraordinary tape? And at first, because I wasn't watching American television, I wasn't deeply immersed, um, I didn't get it. I didn't understand what it was all about. So I got a copy of the tape, both the transcript and the actual tape, and it's indefensible, let me be clear. Uh, I, I am for Donald Trump, I think, compared to Hillary Clinton. Uh, historically, there is no question that Donald Trump is a much less danger to the republic than Hillary Clinton. I believe Hillary Clinton will, may well represent the end of America as we've known it. Her radical court, her radical appointments, her radical policies, things like her statement to a Brazilian bank in a secret speech that she favors totally open borders for the Western Hemisphere, which would let 600 million people come to the United States without any kind of particular check. Um, you, you really look at her in detail. And this is the, the person uh, who used to go and have coffee with Saul Alinsky as a young lady uh, and who really is way to the left of Bill Clinton. So from my perspective, looking at the long-term future of America, uh, I can't imagine the people who are abandoning Trump, even though I understand that they're disgusted. I'm disgusted. I think anybody who just looks at what he said and then looks at the various radio shows that are even older, uh, has to think, you know, he owes all of us an apology and uh, he may owe us an apology every morning for a while uh, because this is really bad stuff. And I suspect this is not the Donald Trump that Callista and I have known. Uh, it's not the person I've worked with. It's not the person I've socialized with. Uh, and I suspect in many ways he's grown beyond that person. But it's a fact that in the modern age, all those things stay alive on videotape. Uh, it'd be very hard to imagine if you had FDR or John F. Kennedy or Lyndon Johnson, or as we do have with Bill Clinton, um, exactly what we might think of them in the same kind of setting. But I kept trying to analyze what was going on because it was like, it was like watching a lynching. Uh, it, it had a, a tone to it of hysteria. Uh, this thing suddenly breaks and it becomes bigger and bigger and suddenly it's consuming everything. And so I began to try to figure out why was the media driving this so hard? And then why were some Republicans falling for it so easily? Let me start with the media. This is the, 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 the precipitating tape, remember, is an 11-year-old tape owned by NBC, who's owned it for 11 years. Um, could have come out the first day that Trump announced for president. Could have come out, could have come out uh, to benefit Jeb Bush, uh, to benefit uh, Ted Cruz, uh, to benefit uh, John Kasich. I mean, lots of guys would love to have seen uh, 
Trump trying to cope with this during the nominating process. But somehow, magically, it never showed up. NBC sat on it. Even as we got into the general election, NBC sat on it. And then you say to yourself, a little bit like Sherlock Holmes, what, what was the precipitating event? What, what might have happened to uh, jar this loose? And you suddenly realize that the WikiLeaks release of the memos about Hillary Clinton's secret speeches happened to be the same day. But of course, nobody noticed them because everybody was so busy panicking about uh, all of the things that Donald Trump said 11 years ago that are grotesque, indefensible. Uh, and he certainly has to, I think, own responsibility. I apologize, we, we have a weak connection here. Uh, but with all of those females around him, I hope he's having some thoughts about both what his saying it does to them. You know, how do you explain to a young granddaughter what grandpa said, all of which, of course, is on TV now? But secondly, I hope he's thinking about what if some man did to them what he described? How angry would he be? How insulted would he be? So I think there's a lot here that Donald Trump has to apologize for. The question is, does it mean he can't be president? Well, as I said, if you apply the current media standard, which, by the way, they only apply to conservatives, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt might have had a challenge. John F. Kennedy would certainly have had a challenge. Lyndon Johnson would have had an absurd, impossible challenge. Uh, Bill Clinton, we all know about it. So there's this interesting media double standard. Donald Trump's tape is worse than any of the actions of the four presidents I just mentioned. But it goes further than that. The news media was desperate to avoid covering Hillary's secret speeches. And when you start looking at the secret speeches, you begin to understand why the news media was so desperate. The one that I think is the most devastating and I frankly don't understand why the Trump campaign has not elevated it, focused on it, and driven it home, is her secret speech to a Brazilian bank, which paid her $225,000 for her speech, having eight months earlier paid Bill Clinton $400,000 for a speech. So the Clinton family collected $625,000 out of this Brazilian bank. Well, in the speech to the Brazilian bank, Hillary says that her dream has been to have uh, open borders for both people and goods. Now, if you take that seriously, she's, after all, speaking in secret. So you can't ever tell with Hillary whether she's lying to everybody or she's only lying in public or she's lying part of the time in secret. But certainly you have to at least consider it's possible that she meant it. Well, that would... An open border Western Hemisphere, which is what she described, would allow 600 million people to come to the United States without visas, without being checked on, etc., if there were open borders, as she described it. Now, she had denied for months that she was for open borders, but this speech is very clear. It is her dream. That's her word, not mine. <clears throat> now, imagine a general election where for the next... 29 days, the Trump campaign drove home a simple test. Do you agree with Hillary Clinton that we need to open our borders for 600 million people in the Western Hemisphere and for a 550% increase of Syrian refugees? My guess is, as a referendum question, that goes down at least 70-30, that the country doesn't want open borders for 600 million people. The country doesn't want her commitment for open trade, which the country believes would just leave more American jobs to leave. The country doesn't want uh, to have another 550% increase in the number of Syrian refugees who aren't being vetted and who may well represent uh, ISIS operatives being planted in them. But it goes a step further. When you combine that idea of open borders, open trade, with Clinton's commitment to higher taxes which she's very clear about, her commitment to more regulations, 
you begin to see a pattern which will simply drive more and more American companies overseas. So you actually have a pattern here <clears throat> that could give Trump a big enough contrast. Now, he's a conservative. The elite media is not going to give him a break. They're going to do everything they can to accelerate. And notice, they are rushing around trying to, to uh, bait Republicans into repudiating him. They, they, they run around and talk about, well, you know, should he be forced off the ticket? And let me just take a moment to explain that. Uh, Randy Evans, who is a Georgia Republican National Committee man, a very successful attorney, the, the, head, the past head of the Republican National Lawyers Association, has looked into all this. We have a whole group of states that are already voting. Uh, Alex Castellanos said on TV this morning, there were 2.2 million. So as I was saying, as a practical matter, even if Trump wanted to step down, which I don't think he does, how would you achieve that? Furthermore, let's say that Trump did step down as these fantasists think. Who replaces him? You're going to go to one of the people he beat in the primaries. You're going to say to the Republican voters, uh, we, the elite, the establishment, are now going to pick somebody. I got a note from a good friend who normally has common sense who said, well, they could pick Romney or Kasich. And I thought, let me get this straight. You're going to say to the millions, I think 14 million Republican primary voters who picked Trump, that you're going to impose on them one of the people who has been deeply, bitterly anti-Trump. Frankly, the person who'd have the biggest claim would probably be Ted Cruz, because he got the second most votes. You could make an outside argument that Pence ought to be the person. But notice what I just did. The second you raise the question about an opening, and you start thinking, well, who should the Republican National Committee pick? And you say to yourself, let me get this straight. A very small group of people, a handful of people, fewer than vote in one, pre in one precinct, are going to sit in a room and they're going to pick the Republican nominee? I mean, this at a period when people are, are in the middle of a populist rebellion, when they distrust Washington, they distrust the establishment, this is the stuff of fantasies. So then you come down to a simple question. Is what Donald Trump did, and it's not defensible, is what he did bad enough that America is better off with Hillary Clinton? Now, you can reach that conclusion, and that's an honorable thing to do. And I think these people who are playing games in the middle, you know, they're, they're not going to vote for Hillary, but they're somehow going to be pure, and they're going to write in somebody. or they're going to, Well, that's nonsense. That, that's, in effect, helping elect Hillary Clinton. I think just the specter of the Hillary Clinton Supreme Court, which could be there for 40 or 50 years, just the specter of uh, Hillary Clinton's commitment to the Brazilians for open borders, just the example of Hillary Clinton's disastrous foreign policy, the level of corruption we're already seeing in the FBI, the Internal Revenue Service, the Veterans Administration, the State Department, down at Central Command, where we had a clear example of dishonest and illegal reporting. Um, I can't imagine if we take the corruption of the Clinton Foundation into the White House, just how much will replace the rule of law with the rule of cronies, the rule of corruption, the rule of payoffs. Um, to me, uh, it would take a lot more to convince me that Donald Trump is a greater threat to the republic than Hillary Clinton. And I mean that as a historic statement, coming very much from the standpoint of being in Rome and thinking about the long sweep of history and how things evolve. And I think people are going to be shocked that in a few days, as the, as the, the media has an ability to panic us and focus us for four or five days. But in the age of social media, they can't keep it up. And so I think over the next four or five days, it'll shake out, and it'll turn out that we're still in a race, despite all the chaos, despite the effort. And I would just caution the Republican leaders who are planning on having conference calls and meetings. None of them got 14 million votes. None of them carried 37 primaries. None of them has waged a nationwide campaign. Uh, they're playing with history. 
Uh, they're playing with a potential split in the party of historic proportions uh, that could go on for a very long time. And maybe that's necessary. Maybe the only way you really fix Washington is to have a real populist uprising that just uh, refuses to accept the excuses of the elite and the excuses of the establishment. People who, by the way, somehow aren't offended by Hillary Clinton saying, you know, in one of her secret speeches, she says, you know, you have to have a different view in public and in private because you can't really have your honest views in public. This is the person who's better than Donald Trump. Um, somebody who says to the, Wall, to the Wall Street people, I really have to have you as friends because I need to raise big money from you. This is the person who's better than Donald Trump? I don't think so. Um, you look at the stream of corruption, the sources of money, and when we talk about treatment of women, you look at the dictatorships that have given money to the Clintons who literally keep women from voting, from driving, from having public lives, uh, countries which execute uh, gays and lesbians. Uh, it's a very strange double standard. And the strangest part is that we fall for it again and again. We're, we are li literally like Linus with the football. Uh, the news media happens to magically find a tape that happens to smother the Hillary Clinton's secret speeches and we all happily follow along behind them. And then they call around and they make the case and they tell you what to think about. Uh, and I watched all the discussions today and 90% of them were how this debate's about Donald Trump's t statements. Not about Hillary Clinton's secret speeches, not about her radical policies, not about this extraordinary idea of opening the American border for 600 million people. Uh, but boy, that Donald Trump, he's the guy you gotta worry about. So what you're seeing is a classic counterattack by the establishment, both on the left, where you expect it, and frankly, on the Republican establishment, who see their chance to break Trump uh, and to get back to the world they used to be comfortable in. It's going to be a fascinating evening. Clist and I are looking forward to it very much. Uh, I'll be commenting on it later on tonight. I will say one thing to let you know where I come down on this stuff. If Trump goes into the gutter and decides he's going to talk about Bill Clinton. It is an enormous, enormous mistake. The fact is that the country is prepared to be polarized over big things. They're prepared to choose control of the border versus 600 million people coming in. They're prepared to choose lower taxes and more jobs versus higher taxes and fewer jobs. They're prepared to choose a new foreign policy rather than war in Libya Somalia, Yemen, Iraq, uh, Li um, Afghanistan, and across the region. I mean, there are really big issues at stake. And I think that Trump would be very wise to make this a big choice campaign about really big issues, apologize for having been stupid and inconsiderate, and, uh, and frankly, totally unacceptable in his behaviors and his, in his words but then move on to talk about how big the choice is. I look forward to the debate. I look forward to a chance to share more things with you on future Facebook Lives. Thank you very much.